2.1, we're starting our introduction to probability. So we have an experiment is any process of observation that has an uncertain outcome, such as if you want to toss a coin, you don't know in advance if you're going to get heads or tails. So anything that is uncertain. Experimental, uh, experimental outcomes are all of your possible outcomes and your or your possible outcomes, and your sample space is all of your possible outcomes. Okay. So what would be your sample space if you toss a coin once? What are your possible outcomes? Heads or tails. Heads or tails. And so the way we're going to write this is you have, so it's an S for sample space, and it is heads or tails as a set. No mathematicians are usually lazy, so I will probably usually write it something like this. Head, H or T for heads or tails. As long as you make it something that I can tell what it's supposed to be, that's fine to use abbreviations. We're going to use a lot of them. Now, what would your sample space be if you want to toss a coin twice? Now, this is an easy enough one that you could probably just list it out by hand, but we like to use our tree diagrams. So, what is your options for the first coin? Heads or tails? And then, no matter what you get on the first coin, it's still possible on the second coin to get a heads or tails. And if you get a tail on the first coin, you can still get a head or tails on the second coin. So we use our tree diagram to make sure we don't miss any possibilities because once you start having 8 or 16 possibilities, it's harder to just list them out. So my sample space, I'm going to write it as head head or head tail or tail head or tail tail. Make sense? Not too bad yet? So, can, you do both? can you do both? Probably without too much work. It'll just take me an extra minute per lesson. So for our next example, if we toss a coin three times, but we're only interested in the number of heads, what would our sample space be? So what are your possible number of heads you could get if you toss the coin three times? Zero, one, two, three. Again, not too bad yet. And since we're mathematicians, if we decide to count the number of people who shop at Lee's this weekend, what would our sample space be? Again, we could start at zero. Is there an upper bound? Theoretically. Okay, so no theoretical upper bound. That's nice. Um, as far as mathematically, we just like the dot, 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 just to represent that the list continues. I will not mark you off if you put an infinity, but this is our accepted notation. Okay. And then we go on to, okay, well that's simple enough, pretty boring. How do we actually find our probabilities? Okay. As far as probabilities go, there's three main ways that we can find probabilities. We're really only going to do the first one in this class. Okay. So some probabilities can be found using logic, and that's basically the classical method. So anything that starts off with like equally likely outcomes, we can find probabilities that way. Okay. So I mean, what would be the probability of tossing a head on a fair coin? 50%. Now in this class, you can write your probabilities as percentages, fractions, or decimals. Okay. You'll usually see me do it in a fraction or decimal. Any one of the three options is fine. And what would be the probability of rolling a six on a six-sided fair dice? It would be one six because there are six options and they're all equally likely. 
So we can go through and we can do a lot of different things with our logic based on this equally likely outcomes. Okay. And then we extend the logic to more complicated situations. So we can find mathematical probabilities. Okay. Probably the most common one out in the real world, if you want to find probabilities, is you think of the probability as the long-term relative frequency. So if we wanted to toss a coin a hundred times or a million times or a billion times and we keep track of how often it comes up heads, that would be our probability of getting heads in the future. So it's just our long-term frequency. How often do we get it if we do the experiment many, many times? And that's how we really find stuff in the real world. And so your probability is the percentage of times that your outcome occurs. And the last one happens as well, but we don't really like it. Okay. Is you just use your best judgment, your experience, okay, your professional judgment to come up with a probability. But of course, that's not going to be very accurate. So things like, how would you find the probability that John prefers a cheeseburger to a sandwich? You know, stuff like that. There's not a mathematical basis for that. Now, I might guess, that, say that you have a 95% chance of passing this class. Now, I'm just guessing based on past history. Now, but the important thing here is there's two ways I could apply that. So I could say in the long run, that's 95 out of 100 students pass the class. Or I could say that's your one-time personal probability of passing the class. So I can interpret that probability two different ways. Or the last example I have in there is the CEO needs to find out if a new product is going to be successful. So he can't introduce it like 10,000 times to find the probability that it's successful, right? That wouldn't make any sense. So again, he's just going to make the best guess he can based on like previous experience, market research, and product testing. Okay. So again, you can see where that would probably come into play a lot. But here's where we start mathematically. Okay. So if we have n equally likely outcomes in our sample space, then the probability for each outcome would be 1 over n. That much has probably come up in at least all of your math classes somewhere, right? <laughs> now at this point, we have two probability rules that all probabilities must always follow and everything else is built off of these. Okay. So we start with our sample space, S with our outcome. So the book labels them 01, 02, 03. And we assign each possible outcome and probability, which we write with the P, parentheses, outcome equals our probability. So now we have a set of our probabilities, P1 through Pn. And all of our probabilities have to follow these two rules. If you ever give me an answer on a test that does not follow these two rules, well, I'm definitely taking off all the points, okay? My biggest pet peeve, if it doesn't follow these rules, don't give me this answer, okay? So every probability must be a number between 0 and 1. If you're writing it as a decimal, it has to be between 0 and 1. Okay, and all the probabilities must add up to 1. So if you add up all the probabilities, you should get 1. So when people give me an answer on a test that has a probability of 1.5, you know they weren't paying attention. So for example, at our certain company, machine breakdowns occur with the following probabilities. So the probability of having an electrical breakdown is 0.2, the probability of a mechanical is 0.5, and the probability, probability of a misuse is 0.3. So on the homework you might be asked, is this a valid probability assignment? Okay. Yes, they are all, so each one is between 0 and 1, and if I add them up, I get 1. So this is a valid probability assignment. And then I might ask you, how many of the next six breakdowns will be caused by mechanical problems? What do you think? Okay. And this is a slightly trick question. Let me ask it this way. The probability of tossing a coin and getting a head is 0.5. But if I toss the coin four times, how many heads am I going to get? 
do I know that I will get two heads? Okay. okay, so this is what we really want to focus on is we might expect to get two heads out of four tosses or here with the probability we might kind of expect to get three out of the six breakdowns be mechanical but remember this is just the probability so we might say something like in the long run we might get an average of three out of six breakdowns due to mechanical problems. But, let's see, so this is still just dealing with probability, but we can't guarantee that three out of the next six breakdowns will be mechanical. That might be the most likely scenario, but we can't guarantee it. We might have two, we might have four. We might even have zero be mechanical, but this is the most likely scenario. So for our next example, we decide to toss a fair coin. What is our sample space and the probabilities for each outcome? So we already know what are our possible outcomes. We can get heads or tail. And as far as the probability, probability of heads is 0.5, probability of tail is 0.5, which we've already gone over. But this is just to emphasize that for a fair coin, it is 0.5 and 0.5, just because I've had people say before, what does a fair coin mean? So let's do something different now. Okay. Let's say that I have a biased coin, meaning that it is not fair. And I know the probability of heads is 0.3. So what is going to be the probability of tails? Why? <coughs> they have to add up to 1. So if all my probabilities have to add up to 1, probability of tails is 0.7. So our next section, section 1.2. We're going to make it just a little bit more interesting. So we start with an event. An event is a set of possible outcomes, so it is a subset of the sample space. So we like to do a lot of diagrams like this. So I'll draw our box. Typically, the box denotes the sample space. And an event then, so let's say we have all of our possible outcomes as dots in here. My event would be I just want to look at some of these outcomes. And we could call that like A. So it is a subset of our sample space. So for our first example, if we toss a coin twice, what outcomes are in the event A, which is defined as exactly one head? So let's just remind ourselves what was the sample space? It was head, 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 tail, tail head and tail tail. So if I want to find my event A, which is all of the outcomes that have exactly one head, which outcomes are in A? Head tail and tail head. And which outcomes are in the event B, which is outcomes with at least one tail? Okay, how does it change? 
We have three options, which are... Okay, tail, tail head, and tail tail. So this is how you find events. You just go through and pick out which outcomes you need. Now, the probability of an event is you're just going to add up the probabilities for each of the outcomes that correspond with your event. So we need to add up the probabilities for head, tail, tail, head, and tail, tail for this situation. Question? Yes. Are there other words we use to define subsets of like a set besides an event? Like we might see, you Yeah, as far as what I'm thinking, I don't think so. Um, not that I've come across in the eight books, different books or so that I've used. So, my husband thinks that we should have two kids. Okay. So if we want to have two kids, we want to talk about their genders, we're going to find the sample space, all of our possible outcomes, and the probabilities of each. Okay. So we're going to assume the probability of having a boy is the same as having a girl. It's not quite 50-50, but we're going to assume it is for this problem. So what are my two options for my first child? Boy or girl. And then whether I get a boy or girl for the first child, I can still get a boy or girl. So my sample space is going to be boy, 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 girl, girl, boy, girl, girl. And now I need to find the probability of each one. Okay. Now, if their genders are equally likely, then what do you think the probability should be for these four outcomes? 0.25 or 1 fourth. So the probability of boy, boy is 1 fourth. Probability of boy, girl, 1 fourth, etc. So at this point, again, everything we've done has been equally likely outcomes. It makes it very easy to find our probabilities. So now let's talk about events. Okay. So for our next example, we want to find our probabilities for each of the events. So if I want to find the probability of having two boys, okay, this is the thing that people get lazy on and they start messing up. If you want to find the probability for an event, first you need to figure out which outcomes correspond to that event. So which outcomes are going to correspond to having two boys? Well, the only one is boy, boy. So the probability of two boys is the, just the probability of boy, boy, which we know is one fourth. So what if I want the probability of having two girls? What outcomes correspond to that? Just girl, girl, so this is an easy one. So two girls, the probability is the probability of getting girl, girl, which is one fourth. So let's make it harder. So what if the probability or what outcomes correspond to having one boy and one girl? So the outcomes are boy, girl, or girl, boy. And it's important here that you realize that the key word here would be or. So either one of these scenarios would satisfy our conditions of having one girl and one boy. Okay, so I can do either one of these. So if I want the probability of one boy and one girl, okay, this is the probability of boy, girl, plus the probability of girl-boy. Again, because either one of those outcomes would satisfy this scenario. So one-fourth plus one-fourth is one-half. Okay. Again, at this point, it seems like these are pretty easy. You can probably do it in your head. But it's getting in the practice of writing down all of the possible outcomes that correspond to your event. Okay. And the probability of having at least one boy
Okay. So if we want one boy or two boys, what outcomes correspond here? So we need the probability of boy boy. And girl boy. So we get three fourths. Okay. So any questions to this point? So let me start with the complement. Okay. So we have events and then we have um, special types of events. So the complement is the complement of any event A is all of your outcomes in the sample space that are not in A. And we're going to use the symbol AC or A prime. Okay. The book uses A prime. I've just finished teaching like three semesters of a class that used AC. So if you see me write AC, that still means A complement. And if you need to be able to draw our diagram, so again, the rectangle is our sample space. If I have my event A, okay, then what would A complement be? The space around it. So I shade everything that is not in A. And that is going to be my A complement. It's everything I shaded in red that was not in A. Now, you'll notice that A and A complement have to make up my entire sample space. And we know that our probabilities have to add up to 1. So the probability of A plus the probability of A complement has to be 1, which means that if I want to find the probability of A complement, I could do 1 minus the probability of A. Now, notice this is what we did in a previous problem. Which example did we use that on without realizing it? Okay, example seven. When we had our bias coin, we knew that the probability of heads was 0.3. Now the complement of heads would be tails, so we did 1 minus 0.3 to get my 0.7. So for my next example, we have this probability model for color preferences. So we think that the probability that someone prefers blue is 0.42, green is 0.14, purple 0.14, etc. So first of all, let's review, is this a valid probability model? What are my two rules? Everything is between 0 and 1. Okay, and they add up to 1. So, anyone? Check that. Do you guys bring your calculators to class yet? Get in the habit of doing that eventually. Okay. And they add up to one. Okay, so you checked it for us. So we're good. So now I might ask something like, what is the probability that a person's favorite color is blue, purple, or orange? How am I going to find that? Add up the probabilities for each of them. So blue is 0.42 plus, let's see, purple is 0.14 and orange is 0.05. So someone with a calculator, want to tell me what that is? 0 0.59? 0 0.61? I'm going to go with the person with the calculator. And now I might ask you, what is the probability that a person's favorite color is not brown? Okay, so how would you do this one? So probability of not brown, you're telling me is 1 minus the probability of brown. 
So 1 minus brown of 0.03 gives me 0.97. Okay. What is another way that I could have figured this out? Add everything up that is not brown, which way was easier? The complement rule. Okay, now this is something that has come up over and over again throughout the previous semesters. As people start doing their homework and they ask, well, how do I know when I have to use the complement rule? Okay. And some of them are pretty obvious. If it says not brown, that sounds like a complement rule. But it comes down to the complement rule is there to save you time. You do not have to use the complement rule. Usually you can do it the long way. Okay. It's there to save you time, but you do not have to use it. So it's not necessarily a, when it says this and this, use the complement rule. It's just if it seems logical to use it, go ahead and use it. And if you can't see that, then do it the long way. So we're playing a game that requires that we roll two dice, and we're hoping to get sixes on our dice. Okay. So what I've done here is I've created my sample space. So this is my sample space, so I can get a one or one and one, one and two, one and three, one and four, one and five, one and six, etc. So these are all my possible outcomes. There are how many outcomes? Thirty-six. Okay. So let's circle the outcomes that are in the event C that we roll at least one dice. Okay, so which outcomes do I need to circle here? Okay, right. everything in the bottom row and the right column. Those are all of my outcomes that have at least one six. So now if I want to find the probability of rolling at least one six, how are you going to find that? Which number? Then add all those, whatever Count all of those outcomes. What is it? 11. 11. So 11 out of my 36. Now, what would C complement be in words? Okay, what is the opposite of at least 1 6? All the possibilities that don't contain 6. Okay, all the possibilities that don't contain 6. Okay. But let's focus on the opposite of just at least one because this is going to come up a lot in your homework. What would the opposite be of at least one? It's going to be zero. Okay. The reason why is your sample space, if you count the number of sixes, then how many possible sixes can you get? You can get zero, one, or two sixes. Those are your possibilities, right? So if you have at least one six, that's the one and two, so the complement is zero sixes or no sixes. So, very important that the complement of at least one is none. Okay. So then the probability of C complement would just be one minus the probability of C. So one minus 11 out of 36 gives me, what, 25 out of 36? Are you still feeling good? Should I make it harder next year? No? Okay. So let's say that our first quiz in this class, I know we don't have quizzes, but let's just say we're going to take a quiz that consisted of three true or false questions and you didn't study. Okay, if you blindly guess at each question, why would I care about blindly guessing or why would I put that in? Equally likely outcomes. Okay. Find the sample space and the probabilities of each sample space outcome and draw our tree diagram. Okay. So the way I do this is I say, okay, well, what are my two options for my first question? Okay. Or let's say, okay, it is true or false, but let's say we care about whether you get it right or wrong. Okay. So your two options would be right or wrong. So right or wrong. Okay. And whether I get the first question right or wrong, does that affect what I get on my second question? No, so I can still get it right or wrong. And even if I got it wrong the first time, I can still get the second one right or wrong. 
So up to two questions, we need to go to three questions. So we're at right, wrong, right, wrong, right, wrong, and right, wrong. Okay. Now, before I did this, could you have told me how many possible outcomes I need to have when I'm all done? There should be... Okay, um, it's actually going to be 2 times 2 times 2, so I'm going to get 8. But we will have an actual formula for that later and go over it officially. But when I'm done, I should have 8, and so that kind of helps me double check to make sure I get it all when I'm done. So let's write down our actual sample space outcomes over here. So I can have right, 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 wrong. And so I'm just following along the branches, so right, wrong, right, right, wrong, wrong. Okay. So again, just go through each of the branches, we have eight of them. And do you see how once I get to these more complicated problems, it is nice to have the tree diagram so I didn't miss an outcome in there. And we said that you're just blindly guessing, so all of my outcomes should be equally likely. So what is my probability for each of these? It is one eighth. So the probability for each one is one eighth. For me, it's easier when I'm doing problems with these simple fractions to so just keep it in fractions. But if you want to write it as decimals, that's fine too. So questions on this first part. So now I might ask you what outcomes are in the event that you get at least one question right? Okay. So look back up so you guys can still have access to it all. Start reading off for me the outcomes that get at least one question right. So all, you said all of them, but the wrong, 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 wrong. Okay. So these are all of my outcomes that are in the event that I get at least one question right. Okay. So then how would you find the probability of getting at least one question right? I need to add up the probabilities of each of those. So at least one right. It's the probability, well... I just add them all up. So it's going to be the 1 8 plus 1 8 plus that dot plus 1 8. And how many of them did I have? 7 out of 8. Now that still only took me about 30 seconds, but is there a faster way to do this? Okay. So do 1 minus what? The probability of wrong, wrong, wrong. Why? It's the complement. Yeah, that's all I wanted you to say. So, just remember that the complement of at least one is none. Okay. So the probability of at least one is one minus the probability of none. So one minus the probability of wrong, wrong, wrong. So <coughs> seven eighths. So again, the common rule doesn't have to be used, but it will save you lots of time. So now let's talk about if each question is worth one point, then what are the possible scores you can get and the probability for each possible score? So what are my possible scores here? 
0, 1, 2, 3, because there are three questions. Okay. What outcomes correspond to the score of getting 0 points? Wrong, wrong, wrong. So the probability is 1A. Which outcomes correspond to getting one question correct? Or one point would be one question correct. So those outcomes are right, wrong, 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 right, wrong, and wrong, wrong, right. And so what would my probability be? Okay. So if I add up the probability for each of those, there are three of them, so my probability is 3 eighths. Okay. Um, so the second one, so which outcomes will correspond to having two points? Read them all for me. Wrong. <coughs> wrong. Or oh, sorry, right, right, wrong. Right, wrong, right, and right. Or wrong, right, right. Okay. And there are three of them, so if I add up the three probabilities, I'm going to get three eighths. And finally, if I want three points, I have to get right, right, right. So there's only one possibility, so my probability is one eighth. Okay. Now, again, at this point, it probably sounds pretty simple, but I'm drilling this in because in my class I'm teaching online, they've gotten to what's called the binomial distribution, and they're doing something very much like this, and they're like, well, why is the probability for zero different than the probability for one. So why is it different? Because there are more outcomes to get what you want. So my probability here is three-eighths instead of one-eighth. So this is going to keep coming up over and over throughout the class. So let's go another step further, and we're going to start talking about combinations of events. So our intersection, or okay, so the event A intersect B. So this is A intersect B, that's the symbol we use. And it means N. Okay. So the intersection, the keyword that we're going to think here is N. So A intersect B is all of the outcomes that are in both A and B. So we're saying, well, when can A and B occur at the same time? So the probability of A intersect B is the probability that they both occur at the same time. They occur together. Okay. We want both of them to happen. Now, if I was to draw a Venn diagram, I might have, so here's A, here's B, and what would my intersection look like? Say it louder. The space where they overlap. The space where they overlap. So that is my intersection. What if I had something like this? Oh, no, that's not what I wanted to draw. Okay, what would I shape my intersection there? Is there an intersection? <laughs> okay. There are complements that intersect, but A and B themselves here do not intersect. So in this one case, there is no intersection. Two shade. And that does happen sometimes, and that's okay. But if they overlap, then that could be of interest to us, and that is our intersection. So for my next example, we're going to draw one card from a standard 52 card deck. Okay. Now, I don't know how many of you guys know what cards are in a 50, standard 52 card deck. Probably most of you do. Okay. You also may not know what 
poker hands are, and I didn't until I took Stats 3000 and I had to use Wikipedia to look them up each time. Okay. So go ahead and memorize what's in a standard 52 card deck because we're going to do a lot of problems with it in this class. Okay. So you start off, you can either be red or black. The red suits are hearts and diamonds, black suits are spades and clubs. And each suit has the numbers 2 through 10 and jack, queen, king, and ace. For purposes of probability, we don't count jokers. We assume they are not in there. So if I ask you, what is the probability that is red and a jack? So probability of red and jack. Okay. How do you think you might find that? It's just like louder. Two out of fifty-two. Because there are two jacks that are red. No. Two jacks that are red. These two jacks, right? Mm -hmm. And a total of fifty-two cards. So not too bad. Oops. So next time I ask you to find the probability that it is black and a number card. So, how many black number cards do I have? 26. No, no, Just the number cards. 18. 18. 18? So, we have 18 out of 52. And finally, the probability that it is black and a uh, heart. Okay, <coughs> so I've heard people saying none. Why? Hearts are only red, so it is impossible to get a black and a heart at the same time. So there are zero possibilities out of a total of 52, so zero. So any time that you have a probability of zero, that means that it is something that is impossible. It cannot happen. So we're going to practice shading our Venn diagrams and finding the probability. And also like writing the events in, word, be, in words, because this is something the book likes to do a lot. This is something that's going to come up in your homework. So the first one is A intersect B. That's easy. What does that mean has to happen? So this means that A and B happen. Okay. Where am I shading? It is the easy part of where they overlap. Okay, and we add up the two probabilities. So the probability of A and B, the two probabilities I just shaded over were 0.13 plus 0.07, so it gives me 0.20. Okay. So not too bad there. Okay, but what is the second one going to look like? So what will it look like if I try and shade A and B complement? Sometimes on this, it helps if you start shading with different colors. So first, let's shade A. So A is going to look like this. Okay. B complement, where is B complement? Everything outside of B. And so where do they overlap? Just the part of A that is not in B. So what does this mean in words? This means that A happens and what? And B does not. And then the probability, I'm going to have to figure out how to get rid of that before class tomorrow. Okay. So the probability of A and B complement, what probabilities were in there? The two probabilities were 0 0.18, 0 0.15, so that gives me what, 0 0.33? So, questions here?
So for three, now I want to shade A and A complement. Okay, so let's practice again just shading in the different colors. So A is everything in here. And B, or sorry, A complement is everything outside of A. So where do A and A complement happen? Or intersect? Okay. Do they intersect anywhere? No. Okay. So there's actually no intersection here. Now, also, if you try to write this in words, you should realize that something funny is happening because A, that means A happens, intersection is and, so A happens and A complement means A doesn't happen. Does that seem like it might create a logical issue? Okay. Obviously, this is impossible. Okay. So the probability of A intersect A complement is zero. Make sense? And then I've asked you, what do you notice about the probability of A intersect B and A intersect B complement? Okay, mm -hmm. so we probably haven't noticed anything yet. And I realize I should have asked you something else first. But let's go ahead and add them up. So look up at the previous page. Sorry, I'm going to, I forgot to tell you. I feel like we can skip four. Do you guys feel okay with that, or do you want me to shade it? I think we're going to put because it would be a lot like number two. Okay, so skipping on to example 16. So what did you notice about the probability of A intersect B and the probability of A intersect B complement? So let's add them together and see what we get. Okay, so can you read off to me what those two numbers were? Point two and what? Point three three. So I get point five three. Okay. Now I realize I didn't set this up because you haven't yet figured this out. But the probability of a. Can you tell me what the probability of a itself is? What numbers do I have to add up for that? It is the point one eight plus point one five plus point one three plus point oh seven. Which, if I add those up, what do I get? Okay, 0.53. So now what do you notice? That the probability of A intersect B plus the probability of A intersect B complement gives me the probability of A. Okay. So do you think that was a coincidence? Okay, let's draw ourselves two small Venn diagrams here and look at this in a little more depth. So here's my A and B, okay. and do you remember where I shaded for the probability of A intersect B? It was this piece right here. And do you remember where I shaded for A intersect B complement? Look up at the previous page, what did I shade? It was this piece right here. So if you think about it, any time this happens, if I add in just the intersection and then just the rest of A, what am I going to get? It's going to give me A, and this will happen every time. So the probability of A intersect B plus the probability of A intersect B complement gives me the probability of A, and that will hold every time. Questions on that? Okay. 
Now we have some facts for intersections. Okay. We'll go through or draw Venn diagrams for some of these. Some of them you can draw on your own later and just convince yourself of them. Okay. So things like A intersect B is the same thing as B intersect A. It does not matter which order you write them in. Okay. Now A intersect the sample space equals A. Does that make sense? So you have your sample space S, you have your event A, and if you want to draw the intersection, it is going to be where they overlap will be all of A. So that would make sense. A intersect A complement is that. What is that symbol? Okay, this is the, in mathematics, we will call it the empty set. It means there are absolutely no outcomes in it. It is nothing, essentially. And so that's what we drew up above for number three. Let's see. A intersect A. Guess what? That's just going to give you A. And A intersect the empty set would give you the empty set. Okay. And also, parentheses don't matter at all for intersections. So like A intersect um, the set of B intersect C. Well, you can move the parentheses or you can also just get rid of the parentheses completely. This could just be A intersect B intersect C. Okay, So all these nice properties hold. Makes it very useful for us. So to continue, we have what's called mutually exclusive events. Another word for this is disjoint, and it really just depends on which book you happen to be looking at at the moment. Okay. And again, the class I've been teaching for the last year and a half uses the word disjoint, and so I'll probably throw that in a lot. Okay. So A and B are mutually exclusive if they have no outcomes in common. Okay. So to draw this, we would have A and B. Notice they do not overlap. So if they're mutually exclusive, what would the intersection be? What outcomes do they have in common? None. None. So the empty set. And the probability would have to be zero. Okay. So we've already seen a couple examples of mutually exclusive events. So like when I asked you what's the probability of getting a black card and a heart card, the probability was zero because it's impossible to get both at the same time. Those would be disjoint or mutually exclusive events. The next thing we learn about is unions. So the event A union B is the union of A and B. Go figure it. It is the event consisting of the sample space outcomes belonging to A or B. And now here's the key word. Or both. So A happens, or B happens, or both. Okay. So A and B is the probability that A or B or both will occur. If I was to draw this, okay. so A happens, or B happens, or both. Okay. So notice I'm just shading everything in A or B. Now it turns out that this could also look like this. Okay. I could have two mutually exclusive events and what would the probability look like here? Or the intersection would just be shade both circles. So that is what our union looks like. Now we do have a nice formula for finding unions. We call it the general addition rule. And it tells us that the probability of A union B, so A or B, is the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of A intersect B. Why do you think I have to subtract that intersection? 
Did anyone notice? So I've heard a couple of you say, did you notice when I shaded this up here, what happened? Okay. So let's redraw it just in case someone didn't notice. So I had my A, here's B. Okay. So when I shaded A, I did everything here. Okay. And I counted the intersection. When I shaded B, I shaded everything here. And notice I counted the intersection twice. And we don't want to count the intersection twice. So to fix that, to not count the intersection twice, we subtract out the intersection. So that is why we have our formula. Memorize the formula, you will be using it. Okay. Well now let's say we have A and B are mutually exclusive, what would the formula be for the probability of A union B and Y? Okay. So we start off with the probability of A union B is the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of A intersect B. But now let's draw a picture of our mutually exclusive event. So that would be here's A, here's B. They don't overlap. Okay, so what's going to happen to that formula? We would just be minusing zero. We know that this has to be zero. That's just a zero. So really the probability of A union B, we just have to add the probability of A plus the probability of B, if they are mutually exclusive. So our next example, let's shade the Venn diagrams for each event and find the probabilities and also write it in words. Okay. So A union B, this means that A happens, too many P's, or B happens, or both happen. We already know how to shade this. It's just everything that's an A or B or both. So it'll look something like that. <coughs> and to find the probabilities, I just need to add up all the numbers that are in my shaded region. So start reading off those numbers to me. We have 0.18 plus 0.15 plus 0.13 plus 0.07 plus 0.11 plus 0.09 plus 0.02. So there's my probability. So let's try the next one. So what does it mean in words if I have A union B complement? So this would mean that A happens or everything but B, okay, or both. What 
do you think that union is going to look like? So let's start shading A first. So A is going to be everything in there, and then B complement is everything outside of B. And so A union B complement is just everything that I have shaded so far. Notice, because I did this union, do I actually end up including a little bit of B? Yes. And that's okay, because it was the union, so I just include everything. So the probability of A union B complement, okay, let's add up those probabilities. So let's see, I have a 0.16 plus 0.01. Plus, let's see, did anyone not cover up that little corner? I guess that's a 0.08 plus 0.18 plus 0.15 plus 0.13 plus 0.07. So point. Seven eight. Or I hear you over here saying, "How did you do it faster?" Complement. The complement rule, because what the complement be? Uh, just minus. Yeah, one minus point one one minus point oh two minus point oh nine. Precisely. Okay, so we could use the complement rule here, and it ended up being faster. Let's just practice shading a couple more. So, A union A complement. What would that mean in words? Everything. It's going to be everything because A happens, or everything not in A happens, or both. So, that means absolutely everything happens. Okay. And if I wanted to shade it, so I shade everything in A, and then I shade everything outside of A, and my union is all of that put together. Okay. And so what is that probability going to have to be? One. Because again, it's going to include everything in the sample space. So let's try A complement union B complement. So in words, that would be everything that's not in A happens, or everything that's not in B happens, or both. Okay. Let's shade it and see if we get anything interesting. Okay. So A complement, let's do that in the yellow first. So everything not in A. So notice that will include things that are in B. So there is everything that's not in A shaded. Now let's shade everything that is not in B. So everything that's not in B will look like this. Okay. And so where do they overlap? Let's shade that in red. So the overlap is everything but the intersection. Kind of an interesting result. If you have not A union with not B, you're going to get everything but their intersection. That's the only thing that we didn't capture here. So if I want to find the probability of A complement union B complement, what do I need to do? I'm going to do 1 minus the probability of A intersect B. So 1 minus 0.13 plus 0.07. So that's going to give me 0.8, because that's a lot faster than adding up all of the rest of the probabilities. Okay. 
And we have some facts for unions, just like the facts for intersections. So A union B is the same thing as B union A. A union the empty set is going to give me A. A union itself still gives you A. A union A complement gives me the entire sample space. We found that out already. Um, A union the sample space would give me the sample space. And again, it doesn't matter where you put the parentheses. These next two results are actually fairly famous. Okay. I'm not going to make you memorize them, but it is kind of nice to see at once, maybe. Okay. So notice here, we did this problem. A intersect, or A union B complement, we just discovered that that was the complement of A intersect B. So we discovered that. And then also, if you want to do A union B, the complement of that is actually A complement intersect B complement. So it's just kind of interesting to see what happens if you try and put the complement on a union, you end up getting an intersection, and the complement of an intersection ends up giving you a union. Again, I will not make you memorize those two results. So let's say that we have a certain company where 15% of the employees have managerial positions, 25% have MBA degrees, and we also know that 9% of the employees are managers and have MBA degrees. So what would be the probability up there of a manager and an MBA? I guess I said fine, like you have to calculate something, but you can just read it off to me. So the probability of manager and MBA is 9%. So 0.09. We can write this as the probability of manager intersect MBA is 0.09. So then I might ask you, are the events manager and MBA disjoint and why? Okay, destroy also means mutually exclusive. Okay, so um, mutually exclusive or destroying, what do they actually mean? That there is no intersection or it's impossible to be both at the same time. So in this situation, is it impossible to be both at the same time? Obviously not, because 9% are both at the same time. So what you can do is you can say, well, the probability of the intersection... is 0.09, not 0. Okay. So anytime your intersection is not 0, then you know that these events are not disjoint. Or mutually exclusive. And finally, I might ask you to find the probability of a manager or, so that is my union, MBA. And what is our probability formula for unions? Minus the probability of the intersection. So, what's the probability of having a manager, or being a manager? 15%, so 0.15. The probability of someone having the MBA is 25%, so 0.25. Minus the probability of the intersection of 0.09. This would be what, 0.31? So the probability of just randomly selecting an employee and having them be a manager or an MBA or both is 31%. Now 
Let's see. So according to the M&M website, the color distribution of their M&Ms is 24% blue, 16% green, 20% orange, 13% red, 14% yellow, and 13% brown. So now I'm going to ask you, are the events blue and orange disjoint? Okay. Now in this case, they didn't tell me the probability of any intersection, so I can't check it mathematically, so let's check it logically. Do you get, or theoretically, are you supposed to get an M&M that is both blue and orange at the same time? No. Sorry. You, you're not supposed to get them at the same time, so that means they are disjoint. So M&Ms shouldn't be blue and orange at the same time, or for the same M&M. &M. Okay. So then we want to find the probability of blue, union, orange. So blue or orange. Now if I start writing out the formula for this, this is the probability of blue plus the probability of orange minus the probability of blue intersect orange. Okay. So, read off those probabilities to me. The probability of blue is 0.24. Probability of orange is 0.2. And what is the probability of the intersection? Zero, because we said they are disjoint. If I thought about it in advance, could I have skipped that step completely? Okay, because I knew they were disjoint, I didn't even need that step, so I get 0.26. Yeah, probably. Thanks. So again, any questions? Okay. So we have, next, let's find the probability that a reader subscribes to the Atlantic Journal or the Beacon News. Okay. This is what we call a contingency table because we looked at people and we classified them in two ways. Okay. Or it might be called a cross-classification table. So the first thing we looked at is whether or not they read the Atlantic Journal, and then we also looked at whether they read the Beacon News or not. Okay. And so it is possible for them to overlap here. So let's look at the probability of Atlantic Journal or Beacon News. Okay. So how do you think you can find that this probability? And there are there's more than one way. Okay. So like what number should I be writing down? Two hundred fifty thousand. Okay, I heard someone say that. Let's write that number down. out of anything specifically? A million. A million? Sorry. Okay, what else? Let's see, you said plus 650,000? I think we're going to be combining the two different ways if I do that. So let me say here, so I could just go through and highlight everyone that's in the Atlantic Journal or Beacon News or both. So these people are in the Atlantic Journal. These people are in the Atlantic Journal. And then for Beacon News, it would be these people and these people. Okay. So I could just add up all those numbers. So it's 250,000 plus 250,000 over a million plus the 400,000 over a million. So that's just adding up the individual components. So that gives me 0.9. And that's just kind of thinking about it of all the components that are in, in at least one of those events. So Atlantic Journal or Beacon News or both. How would you do it if you actually wanted to write out the formula? So if I wanted the probability of AJ plus the probability of Beacon News minus the probability of the intersection. Okay. 
then what would those numbers be? 500,000 plus 650,000 minus 250,000. So the total um, Beacon News is 500,000. Total Atlantic Journal News is 650,000. And then I have to minus the intersection because here I double count the intersection twice. I double counted it. So minus the 250,000 over a million. And if you put that in your calculator, what do you get? I still get 0.9. So you can use the formula, or for something like this, sometimes it's easier to just look at it logically and say, well, which numbers would I circle that are in one or the other or both? Or you could look at who doesn't subscribe. Or you could look at the complement of who doesn't subscribe, yes. So this next thing is when we have the union of three events. So we've talked about the union for two events. There's also a union for three events. This is a complicated looking formula. I will not make you memorize it, but you will probably end up needing it somewhere in your homework, so I am going to show it to you. So the probability of A union B union C. Okay. Well, first thing you do is you add up each of the individual probabilities. So A plus B plus C. Then you have to minus out the intersection. So you minus the probability of A and B, A and C, B and C. But then it turns out that we actually subtracted too much, and we have to add back in the intersection of all three. Okay. So big, long formula. You don't have to memorize it, but if it comes up on your homework, come look at it and use it. It will not be on the test. Now, if you wanted to find the probability for the union of mutually exclusive events, this one is easy to do, okay? Because if they don't have anything in common, you don't have to worry about subtracting out intersections or adding anything back in. You just add them all up. So you can do that for any number of events, A1 union all the way up to AN. You just add up all of their individual probabilities. Makes it very easy if they're mutually exclusive. And the last thing that we'll cover today is a partition of a sample space. So a partition of a sample space is when you divide the sample space up into mutually exclusive events, A1 through AN. And so each outcome is going to be in one and only one event. So it could look something like this. So here's my sample space. And I can carve off this chunk of the sample space, and that could be A1. And then I might take a larger piece to be A2. And I could have maybe here's A3. And maybe this piece could be A4. So you notice there doesn't have to be any pattern here to my partitions. All that matters is they all need to be mutually exclusive. So they can't overlap at all. And when I'm done, every event needs to be contained or every outcome needs to be in one of these events. So let's say this is my last one, AN. So I might have an outcome here, and an outcome here, outcome here. So my dots are my outcomes. And I could have several outcomes in each event, but each outcome itself can only go in one of these events. And so we've just split up my sample space completely into all of these events, and that's called a partition. So if you split it up completely into mutually exclusive events, you have a partition. Useful later on.